Each year we gather with our chaplains and staff, faculty and staff colleagues and partners, student leaders, beloved alumni, and close friends, both here in the room and also this year joining us by live stream, to explore an important topic related to spiritual life in our time. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome back to Tufts Ibu Patel of the Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago. And I think Ibu is still actually preparing to speak to us, so he's across the street. So I'm just going to talk about him for a minute. Um, so Ibu has been a friend, a co-laborer, and an inspiration in the field of interfaith engagement and interfaith leadership in higher education to many of us for many years. He is one of the most recognized and esteemed voices nationally and globally calling for a vision of a nation and world in which our religious and philosophical differences do not divide us, but actually bring us closer together, where we can be inspired and challenged by the best in each other's traditions to work together for the common good. And so it made great sense this year that the University Chaplaincy and the Tisch College of Civic Life would partner to invite Ibu and his colleague Rebecca, who I think is here. Where are you, Rebecca? Oh, there you are. Great. Welcome. Uh, to help us engage in a conversation about where we are personally and as a campus in our work for interfaith leadership in this time. Four years ago, Ibu Patel came to Tufts to speak as our common reading author for the first year class, the first years who are now the senior class. And uh, much has changed, as we know, over the past four years. Not only have our wide-eyed first years become serious seniors getting ready for graduation in a, in a month or so, but we have a new administration in the White House. We have seen a rise in hate crimes and acts of violence around the country. There is a rising tide of nationalism and populism around the globe. And in many ways, our society and politics feel, to many of us, more polarized than they have in much of our lifetimes. Meanwhile, our society continues to become more and more diverse. We have more access to information from around the globe at faster speeds. And we become more aware all the time of the profound challenges facing us morally and ecologically. At Tufts, according to our spiritual interest surveys we do with incoming students, about 80% of incoming undergraduates want us to know what their religious and philosophical identities are. And some 65% of incoming students say that they are interested in some form of interfaith engagement. Involvement with the university chaplaincy and the many spiritual and philosophical groups on campus has been growing steadily over the past several years. Interfaith programs like our CAFE uh, pre-orientation program has grown every year. And there's a vibrancy to our intersectional work around spirituality and social justice with so many campus partners who are here tonight. And so we wanted to invite Ibu back to Tufts to give the Russell Lecture four years after his last visit to give us his sense of the interfaith movement in our time. What are its most pressing challenges? What are the greatest opportunities that are facing this class of first years, now seniors, as they graduate from Tufts and go out into the world? What are the opportunities before all of us as educators, as activists, people of faith, people of conviction, working to advance religious literacy, uh, spiritual pluralism, civic engagement, and work for social justice? Uh, Ibu and Rebecca, we welcome you back, and we thank you so much for being with us. We've been looking forward to your visit, and we are so excited for tonight's Russell Lecture. I will almost, uh, in just a moment here, invite our Buddhist chaplain, the Venerable Priya Shraman, to offer some words of grace. Then we'll be invited to share the buffet dinner that is uh, at the back that has been prepared so beautifully for us. Uh, during supper, we will hear some remarks offered by Tufts Chief of Staff, Michael Bannon, and then our Muslim chaplain, Dr. Selene Ibrahim, will introduce Ibu um, in, uh, in a few moments. So uh, we want to say thank you to everyone who has been working so hard to make this event possible. Dean Allen Solomont, Jess Burns, and their colleagues from Tisch College, Zach Cole, Alex Chu, Shelby Carpenter from the University Chaplaincy, all of our chaplains and staff who are here tonight, who are sprinkled through the room as, as our table hosts, and anyone who assisted in any way to bring together this event. We're so happy you all are here. Welcome again, and please join me in welcoming uh, Venerable Priya. In the Buddhist scripture, there's a very interesting statement about our spiritual growth. In that statement, it names two key elements that are conducive to our 
individual spiritual growth. It says, the two elements are wise reflection and the voice of another. Now, whenever I think about it personally, it has always been true. In my spiritual growth, it has been the voice of a kind friend, a kind colleague, and many others that have helped me in my growth. So today, as we are grateful for the food, I want all of us to, I want to invite all of us also to be thankful for the company that we are in. So <clears throat> let us take a moment to acknowledge all the factors that brought this nourishment today in the form of food, in the, from, in the form of our company, in the form of our friends, colleagues, strangers, and the community, both interfaith and international. I want to say a few words in Buddhist uh, Pali language that is used to express gratitude. Abhivadana silesa nichang vadda pachaino chattaro dhamma vadhanti ayuvanno sukhang palang. Please enjoy your meal. Um, it's an honor to introduce Michael Bannon, who is Chief of Staff in the Office of the President at Tufts and a key advisor to the University Chaplaincy. Michael brings to his leadership role a deep appreciation of the importance of diversity and progressive thought in higher education broadly, and at Tufts in particular, which historically and today has included the importance of spiritual and ethical life and learning. We are so grateful for all of his advice and support, and we welcome you, Michael, to please bring greetings and share your thoughts on this occasion. So this is always one of my favorite uh, events of the year under uh, Greg and his colleagues' leadership. It has really flourished as an opportunity not just to bring thought leaders in contemporary religious, spiritual, and ethical life to campus, but also to bring together on campus the community of all of those people who care about these issues, which is often a virtual community. And so to get everybody in the room from a variety of faith traditions and ethical and philosophical perspectives, to think together about um, what the speaker says, to hear each other's questions is always a treat. I also like this because it's a chance for some of us to thank the chaplaincy team and their colleagues and the many students who work uh, so hard on a range of uh, programs each year for all that they've done. We're coming up to the beginning uh, to the beginning of what I call the sort of the awards season of uh, academic of the academic year, and I want to take this opportunity just to do a few shout outs. Uh, for all of the great things that the chaplaincy team has been doing. Um, first, I'd like to offer special thanks to Tisch College for partnering with the chaplaincy on this year's Russell Lecture. Um, I think it's very exciting. It amplifies the impact of Ibu's presence on campus, and it reflects um, Tisha's very real understanding of the importance of religion, ethics, and values to a healthy civic life. So thank you, Alan, and thank you to all of your uh, colleagues, particularly Jess, um, for that work. Um, it's been a really great year for the chaplaincy and its partners. Um, new colleagues on campus, uh, including uh, at um, Tufts Hillel, which is such a, an indispensable partner to the chaplaincy, uh, Rabbi Dr. Naftali Brower as the new Jewish chaplain at Tufts and Neubauer Executive Director of Hillel. Uh, Naftali and his family have already become integral members of the Tufts community, and he is making sure that Hillel um, moves forward with the dynamism that has characterized it for the last decades. Um, also, welcome to Thomas Dawkins, new music director and organist, immensely, immensely talented. Um, great to have him on campus. And it's really been a great year for all the chaplains. Um, we heard a beautiful grace earlier from the venerable Priya, and I wanted to, to note that both Priya 
and um, his humanist colleague, Walker Bristol, are now in full-fledged chaplain positions. Both the humanist and Buddhist positions were established really as pilots a few years ago um, to see what the response would be, to see what sort of impact having representatives from those traditions could make on campus and to the work of the chaplaincy. And thanks um, in no small measure to the personal qualities of the individuals, but also to the importance of the, um, of the themes that they bring. Both of those positions, uh, as of this year, are now chaplain positions. And so congratulations to both of them on that well-deserved promotion from, I think it was humanist in residence and Buddhist in residence, to really being chaplains along with the rest of the team. So congratulations. Um, I, uh, Celine, do you, do you have a visual aid that you can hold up for everybody? Oh. <laughs> so, um, Celine continues to, uh, Celine Ibrahim, our uh, Muslim chaplain, continues to do amazing work, and one of her accomplishments this year is uh, the release of a new edited volume on interfaith encounters and connections across religious divides, entitled One Nation Indivisible. It's particularly nice that it includes um, work by Tufts alumni, one of whom is our own Catholic chaplain, Lynn Cooper. So congratulations, Celine. I should mention that Celine actually also has a contract for an upcoming book with Oxford University Press, which is very exciting. I saw her holding this and I thought, Oxford doesn't work that quickly. Uh, <laughs> Lynn um, has had a very, I think, you know, rich but also challenging year because this has been not an easy year for the Catholic community on campus, in this country, anywhere in the world. Um, to see one of the world's great um, religious traditions and um, institutions have to grapple so deeply with um, fundamental ethical and value problems as, as an institution um, and for Catholics as individuals um, has been um, challenging and Lynn has been doing amazing work supporting our Catholic community in a tough time. Um, Dan Bell, our Protestant chaplain, has continued to do wonderful work. I want to salute Dan especially for his outreach beyond the student community to staff and faculty. He's done a great job um, thinking about how to engage staff and faculty in spiritual reflection. Um, and he's continued to get wonderful, wonderful support from the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts for which we're very grateful. Um, I won't try to enumerate all of the great programs that have gone on across the year. Um, they range from big signature events to countless small-scale gatherings that bring students, faculty, staff, and the chaplains together to, to grapple with really important issues. Um, I do want to highlight the chaplaincy's commitment to issues of diversity and inclusion, which included um, partnering with the chief diversity officers and the provost's office for a very successful Tufts table dedicated to the people's supper and reweaving our social fabric. Uh, and for their support for the community whenever it deals with loss and uh, difficult situations. Um, really important work. We have a lot of students here tonight, many of whom are active members of the Interfaith Student Council, and none of this work would be possible without your engagement. Um, we know that you all are incredibly busy as tough students, and the amount of energy and time that you put into volunteering for your traditions and for the greater good of the community is extraordinary. Um, Greg mentioned CAFE, which had a very successful um, year, uh, very record participants uh, last August. They're now getting ready for the 2019 uh, edition of CAFE, and particularly gratifying to see CAFE highlighted in some of the contributions in a new book uh, co-edited by Ibu Patel, this evening's speaker, uh, Educating for Religious Diversity and Interfaith Engagement which is intended as a handbook for student affairs professionals as they think how to work on these important issues. Um, the chaplaincy continues to try to reach out through uh, 
enhancing its communications with alumni and friends, and it's also actively engaged with the professional communities off campus. So um, kudos for engagement with programs such as Boston, the Boston Interfaith Leadership Initiative and Boston Bridges for Emerging Leaders, and with rabbinical colleges, campus chaplaincy for a multi-faith world project. Um, Zach Cole, who's um, a tremendous asset to the chaplaincy, uh, is very actively engaged in the major National Association of Student Affairs Professionals and played a leading role in a major conference that they presented in New Orleans on uh, religious, spiritual, and secular identities in December. Really important topics for student affairs professionals to be considering. Um, I can't really say enough about Greg, who is um, the energizer bunny of university chaplains, um, and somehow manages at the same time to be continuing to make progress on uh, his doctoral degree, which I really admire. Um, he's been elected to the board of the Association for College and University Religious Affairs. Um, he's been active on the national level ever since he arrived at Tufts, and he's an incredible ambassador for the university. Um, I think the it's been an amazing year. The chaplaincy has some exciting programs yet to come, including some very interesting explorations about how interfaith work in particular might be integrated into Tufts' academic work in civic studies, another area where Tisch College um, is really uh, paving the way. So uh, thanks to everybody who's made this another tremendous year at Tufts. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to more great years ahead, and I think that we'll all be able to look ahead to that work, drawing on the kind of um, reflections that we'll hear from Ibu tonight. So thank you. Greetings and peace tonight. It's such a joy to be here with all of you, and especially with our esteemed guest, who I have the honor of introducing now. I'm going to give a little bit of a vignette here, so bear with me. Many of you have probably found yourself in this situation where it's really late and where you should probably just go to bed, but then you have this book that's just calling out to you. So you say to yourself, I'll just read a few pages. And then you know, a few hours later, you realize it's the middle of the night. You haven't really slept. You're about to uh, you know, have a commitment in the morning. And you've had a wonderful venture through someone's life, seeing the world through their eyes and, and being inspired yourself to think about your life anew. So you might guess that this was my experience in, in reading Ibu's, one of his very first books that uh, impacted me so greatly as a young person in, in graduate school, wondering what was I even doing in this multi-faith uh, program? What was, the, what was the professional possibilities for me? And Ibu has been, in so many ways, for so many of us sitting in this room tonight around the, the US, around the world, has been that model of how to take a passion and turn it into a movement. And so I introduce to you tonight uh, someone who is a personal mentor, someone who is a visionary, and someone who uh, never hesitates to shift the framework or, or propose something that's uh, radically new and has not been done before. Uh, someone who doesn't hesitate to look at the gigantic picture and say, and I have an idea for a step one for how to realize this goal. So I introduce to you today someone who's a nonprofit leader who has shaped the field of interreligious relations such that people know now what the word interreligious more or less means. Uh, I introduce to you someone who's a national activist who served in, on the inaugural committee, for instance, of President Obama's uh, Faith and Advisory Committee. 
uh, someone who is a, a devoted uh, Muslim and who inspires uh, many Muslims to, to be vocal, to be present in America and, and to not hesitate from, uh, from, from contributing to the common good. Uh, so without further ado, I, I welcome Ibu Patel to tonight's Russell Lecture. Thank you, Ibu. You people are so nice. You're nice to me, you're nice to each other. This is so much, last night I was at home uh, preparing to come here packing my bags, and my younger guy, he's nine, just turned nine, Khalil, says to my older guy, Dad's going again? What, what does he do? <laughs> and Zaid says to Khalil, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he does there what he does here. I was thinking, I'm like, kind of that's true, actually. So um, I have a little bit of a cold. I'm going to do my best to get through this without going, uh, getting into a hacking spree. Let me find a place to put this glass of water. And to equally express my admiration for Greg and the chaplaincy, the great work that's happening at Tufts. Uh, I see lots of friends from the Boston area uh, here tonight. Uh, what a blast. So much fun. So uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, happened to me a few years ago in Chicago. Uh, a friend of mine introduces me to the CEO of the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And I show up there early on a Tuesday morning, and uh, the CEO and the executive vice president take me on this tour of this food depository. Anybody been to a major city's food depository? It's kind of amazing, right? Like on the one hand, it's like, it's like a football field size in, in, in length and width, and it's like, I felt like two or three stories high, just stacked with canned goods and in some places fresh vegetables and there's trucks pulling up to, uh, to make deliveries all over the Chicagoland area. And you think to yourself like, wow, like this is in so many ways, this is a human achievement, right? Like this is what a group of people are doing together to help other people. And then you think to yourself, you know, richest nation in human civilization and we still have so many hungry folks. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting kind of um, hopeful moment and also a sobering one. In any case, I'm there, I'm getting this tour, and I'm fascinated. They have a kitchen there, and they're training chefs, and you know, like I'm seeing how the whole operation works. And uh, about an hour in, I'm like, so y'all are like busy and important people. What am I doing here? Why, why, why did you ask me to come by? Why are you spending all this time with me? And they sit me down with a couple of, of, uh, of uh, forms that they had, had printed out for this meeting. And they said, look, we've done an audit of of our entire operation. And we discovered some things that we kind of knew at a gut level were true, but we now have the numbers for them. So first set of numbers. We have 650 distribution sites across the Chicago Lane area. I mean, clearly not every hungry person is driving to this one location to pick up their bag of groceries, right? They have places all across from like, you know, Elgin to Wheaton, down into the south suburbs, all around the Chicago Lane area where people go and get their, their food. And of those 650 sites, they said, we have found that at least 450 are faith communities. Churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, sanghas. Interesting, right? And we did a similar kind of audit of our volunteers. And we have probably tens of thousands of volunteers through here every, every year. Um, hundreds over the course of a week to unpack trucks and bag boxes of groceries and like basically get the food packed up so that it can be sent out to these 650 places. And at least two thirds of the people who volunteer here volunteer with a religious community. And you can actually watch this happening. If you stand up here in the balcony above the kind of warehouse area where all the food is stacked, if you stand up here on a Sunday afternoon around three o'clock, uh, you will literally see six or seven different faith communities walk in when the volunteer bell rings for three o'clock, they volunteer in 90 minute shifts or whatever. You'll see them file in. You'll know they're different faith communities because they're wearing the kind of lime green, banana yellow shirts that you see, you know, with kids who are heading off to, to mission trips uh, in airports, uh, um, uh, which I see every summer. 
Um, so you know they're associated with faith communities and they kind of file in into their row and you will watch them run through literally the same format. They'll have kind of a moment of silence or prayer and then the youth leader or the pastor or whoever it is that's kind of leading the group will say a few words, oftentimes read from what appears to be from the balcony scripture, probably is scripture. They'll volunteer for 75 minutes or so, and then that leader will lead them in a short reflection. Presumably, you know, what did we learn about our religion and about helping others, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll see these six or seven groups file out, and they will acknowledge each other's existence by doing one of these. And we've been thinking to ourselves about how important diverse faith communities are to the greater Chicagoland Food Depository. Our most effective public service announcements are when we have uh, pastors do public service announcements. We've had a couple rabbis do them. We're thinking about having imams do them. They're really effective because those folks connect cosmic issues and ideas to serving others. Our most effective lobbying days in the state capital of Springfield is church day. There's now a synagogue day and a mosque day. And so these people from different faith communities will, will uh, organize a group of buses and go down and talk to Springfield legislators about how the Bible speaks to uh, um, solving the problems of the poor and the hungry. I see Alex Kern smiling there because this is the stuff he did for 20 years. Uh, and we've been thinking to ourselves, what would it look like to have an interfaith public service announcement? What would it look like to have interfaith volunteer efforts? What would it look like to have an interfaith day of organizing in Springfield? And then at the executive table, right, this is happening at senior levels of the organization, we think about all of the pitfalls. What happens if somebody says, hey, it's a great idea to pray together, and a religious group is like, we don't do that. We don't, we pray in this way and not with other people. What if uh, on the bus on the way down, an interfaith day in Springfield, uh, somebody brings up a political issue which divides folks? And people say, next year we're not coming. This is, this is not what we do this for. And so we've been thinking to ourselves recently that there's all of this opportunity when it comes to interfaith bridge building at the Greater Chicago Land Food Depository, but frankly, the challenges are too great, the risks are too high, so we're just keeping the status quo. And then, you know, my friend Sonny Garg tells me about IFYC, and I figured, well, why don't we have this guy, Ibu Patel, come in, and uh, uh, maybe he can give us some advice. So I'm gonna stop the story there. And let's just back up for a second and think about what does this say about our society? I want to point out a couple things, right? By the way, does it, does it surprise anybody in this room that two-thirds of the distribution centers for the Greater Chicago Land Food Depository are communities of faith? Surprise anybody? That two-thirds of the volunteers are, are faith, not, not individual religious people, but organized faith communities. Does it surprise anybody? So, uh, you know, Robert Putnam across the way there, uh, a little place called Harvard, um, uh, smaller than Tufts, I know. Um, that's right, exactly. The, the poor souls who were sent over there. Uh, he points out in his book, Bowling Alone, that probably 50% of American civil society can be traced back to religious communities and religious commitments. So this is actually pretty remarkable, right? Like the whole civic fabric, the Greater Chicagoland Food Depository, uh, American colleges and universities, there's 2,800 four-year residential colleges and universities in America. Catholics have built about a tenth of them, 230. Methodists have built about 100. A bunch of places that you might not associate with Methodists, Duke, Emory, Syracuse, USC, all built by Methodists. ELCA has 24, right? Really interesting. A significant part of American higher education built by religious communities. The same can be said for hospital systems. Just today I read a story about the terrible floods in Nebraska. 
Anybody want to guess who's going door to door in Nebraska, wading through the floods, making sure everybody's okay, that the elderly are in a safe place, that animals are safe, draining the water from basements? Anybody want to guess who they're principally associated with? Religious communities. Really interesting question. As fewer and fewer people go to religious communities, show up in church on Sunday for Juma prayer on Friday afternoon, for Shabbat services on Saturday morning, what happens to all those disaster relief organizations? What happens to the Catholic schools in the Chicagoland area, which serve 80,000 students? You know how many students are in the Chicago public schools? Total, 400,000. So the Catholic schools have no small percentage of them. As people stop going to church on Sunday and putting their 20 on the plate, what happens to those schools? 50% of the students aren't Catholic. Overrepresentation of kids who are poor and minority. Religious communities play an absolutely central and essential role in American civic society. And as those communities sociologically erode, what happens to American civil society? Tufts will be fine. St. Jude's in Englewood? I'm not sure. Kids need that school. What's going to happen? Second thing I think that's interesting about this story is that these really smart people at the top of this organization who kind of knew this was true, the extent of religious participation in making the Chicagoland Food Depository run, still didn't have the confidence to say that we're going to move forward on something, we're going to be proactive about it because they thought that the risks were too high. And you know what? The truth is the risks in interfaith work are high. Right? And anybody who does this professionally, or even just as a hobby, you know, Greg, Alex, Jenny, anybody in here, right, we have made the mistake of let's, let's pray together, or uh, let's campaign for this together, or don't we all agree on this? And you realize pretty quickly that you know, religious diversity is not just about the differences you like, and that people who orient around religion differently actually have very different views on matters of ultimate concern. There are distinctive features to religious communities. It's not like you can take all the knowledge you have gleaned from race and gender and sexuality and superimpose it all the way over to religious communities. Right? I'll never forget the time where uh, uh, somebody said to a Muslim friend of mine, you know, we're, we're so sorry about how oppressed you are in American society. This person looks at my friend and says, God gave me the last prophet and the final revelation. I never think about being oppressed. Surah 93 says that I should only be thankful and give gratitude to the Lord. So that is an interesting, distinctive feature of a religious tradition. Not every Muslim feels like that, but probably don't want to talk to an observant Muslim about how he or she views his or her social condition without having at least some familiarity with theology. So what did I tell uh, the folks of the Greater Chicagoland Food Depository? Some version of, you should hire a Tufts graduate. I'm actually mostly serious about this. We live in the most religiously diverse nation in human history, the most religiously devout nation in the Western Hemisphere, at a time when religion is a flashpoint of tension, is a growing divide, is opportunities for extremism and conflict. The Greater Chicagoland Food Depository that social context, which is to say a social context in which people who orient around religion differently are constantly interacting with each other, even if only in a, a, a head nod type ways, that is more and more every school, every hospital, every social service agency, 
every recreational uh, uh, facility as religious diversity becomes more and more a feature of American civic spaces, do we not think that there are going to need to be experts and professionals who are able to lean in positively to that dimension of diversity, to bridge it, to strengthen social cohesion, to increase social capital, to reduce prejudice, to create a, a larger sense of we, to be able to do that well, to be able to figure out uh, whose hand do you shake and whose hand don't you shake, to figure out actually we have an overrepresentation of Shia Muslims here, it would be really, gay, really great to get Sunni Muslims to know maybe these groups of people are willing to have a moment of silence together, but we will respectfully recognize that this group of people is not going to participate in that, which discussions to have and which not to have. In other words, just as multiculturalism has taken off, just as ESL has taken off, just as we are increasingly aware of various genders and sexualities in civic spaces, do we not think we're going to need a similar level of interfaith literacy and leadership in order to realize the opportunity of religious diversity and guard against the challenges and threats? Let me take you back some uh, 60 years or so, maybe longer, 80 years if I can do my math right, uh, to an experience that a great comparative religion scholar had, which got him thinking differently about the social and political context of religious diversity and the intellectual approaches to understanding that and building healthy, religiously diverse democracies. So Wilfred Cantwell Smith, who also spent a good part of his career at a university nearby, uh, when he was a, a young man, uh, straight out of Cambridge, um, he gets sent by the Canadian Missionary Society. This is the early, mid-1940s. Uh, he's a very serious Presbyterian. Uh, he's sent by the Canadian Missionary Society to a city named Lahore, which is in present-day Pakistan, but back then it was part of an undivided India under British colonial rule. Cantwell Smith is in his mid-20s. Uh, he is a teacher at Foreman Christian College. And he probably goes there with, you know, with some pretty strong missionary commitments, right? But when he gets there, he has this really interesting realization that the students he's teaching and the faculty that he's teaching with are Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and Jains and Buddhists and the odd secular humanist here and there. And that while where they taught was Foreman Christian College, what they were really doing was trying to create a community that was religiously diverse. A couple of things come to Cantwell Smith's mind, that he believed into the day that he died uh, that Christianity had the feast, especially his Presbyterian interpretation of it, um, that Jesus was Lord and Savior, uh, and evangelizing other people is not the first thing that comes to mind when you need to ask your colleagues, where do I find bread in grocery stores around here? a very serious way, right? Like, there are a whole set of, like, neighborly-type concerns and issues that rise when you're in a new country and you're on somebody else's turf. And so you want to make friends and be a respected colleague. Something else comes to his mind. Although I deeply believe in my tradition, I am learning to have a lot of respect for these Hindus that have a strong commitment to vegetarianism, to these, for these Jains who have an even stronger commitment, don't eat onions or garlic, for these Muslims who perform prayer five times a day, including waking up early in the morning and fast from sunup to sundown, no water during Ramadan. Like, these people in real life, they're not the people I read about in my missionary books. And so this thing called a religiously diverse community 
it's actually something that I want to build. A couple of striking things about this. Uh, back then, not Cambridge where he did his master's, nor Toronto where he did his undergrad, nor the Boston area where he would become a young professor were religiously diverse. Canada, England, the United States were largely religiously homogenous societies, largely Jews, Protestants, and Catholics. The 1965 Immigration Act had not yet happened, the act that brought many uh, people from different parts of the world to the United States. The uh, labor intakes of, uh, of post-war Britain had not yet happened. And so Cantwell Smith, he's kind of seeing the future, right? But he realizes this that I'm seeing in Lahore, this is coming to Louisville. I mean, this religious diversity is not gonna stay here. And so he starts to have these big thoughts and he thinks to himself, you know what? The questions I'm asking myself right now, am I really a Christian if I'm not trying to evangelize these folks? How do you build a religiously diverse community? How do you stay true to your own religious practices and views and commitments while having great respect for others? I mean, these are like major psychological and theological questions. He says, in 20, 30, 40 years, everybody's gonna be asking these questions. And by the way, it's not just about this little school. Here in the mid-1940s in Lahore, I'm literally watching religion blow up all around me, right? Six Hindus, Muslims, all in no small part because of the colonial context under the British Empire, constantly at each other's throats. And a couple of years later, more than a million die in virtually hand-to-hand -hand combat in partition. So this like religiously diverse society thing, this is a major issue actually says in this essay, it is going to take the same kind of minds, the same level of intellect and commitment that we're currently putting into nuclear physics. How do you build a healthy, religiously diverse society? He goes to Princeton and does a PhD, and it's actually after that that he writes this essay. And one of the things that he points out is, as much as he learned about religious systems in his PhD at Princeton, he didn't learn that much about what would have helped make that a religiously diverse community at Lahore Christian College. I wanna say this again, right? Because this is kind of an important turning point in this talk. He goes to, PA, to Princeton to do a PhD in religion, and he says, I learned an awful lot about religious systems, but what I was really curious about was not the fact that there is a call to prayer in Islam, but what the call to prayer means to Muslims, and whether we should have one out loud for the small number of Muslims on the faculty at Lahore Christian College. Should we have vegetarian food because the Brahmin Hindus on the faculty can only eat food that is cooked in an all-vegetarian environment? how do you build a religiously diverse community? And what he says in this essay is it is going to take a whole different form of intellectual inquiry. That's what I wanna to turn to now. How do we build a healthy, religiously diverse democracy? And what kind of academic preparation would help us do this? One of the things that struck Cantwell Smith was that he learned a lot about Islam in graduate school, but he had been around enough Muslims to know that Muslims were not walking Islams. In other words, you can learn a lot about a system and not actually know that much about people because people are not simply dropped from the system. We are formed in all sorts of other ways. I'll tell you a, a funny story about this, a um, uh, story that Barbara, I heard from Barbara Brown Taylor. Uh, one of the reasons Barbara Brown Taylor, the great uh, um, Episcopal preacher, uh, got interested in interfaith work. She's teaching world religions at Piedmont College in Georgia. And they're doing the, the uh, part of the book on Islam, and there's like several pages spent on Sunni and Shia. 
So, so what do Christians think when they see Sunni and Shia in a book about Islam? What's their immediate reference point? What? That's right. So she loved it. She's like, I know what this is about. So she devotes like three class periods to this, right? It's a, it's a big deal. It's a big deal in Christianity. It has to be a big deal in Islam, right? So uh, spend, spend all this time on this. And uh, at some point, the students in the class, mostly Christian kids from Georgia, realize that there's an exchange student from Sierra Leone. His name is Muhammad. So they're super excited. They know something about Islam. They can talk to this kid about something. So they're like, they're like Muhammad. Are you a Sunni or a Shia? He says, I haven't heard those terms until last week. <laughs> right? Muslims are not just walking in slums. The context of wherever Muhammad grew up in Sierra Leone, it's the Sunni Shia thing, didn't mean that much. How do we build a religiously diverse democracy that's with real people and not with abstract systems? So, uh, in coming here, I spent a good part of my time. Uh, um, uh, reading uh, Peter Levine stuff on civic studies. And like, I totally geeked out, right? Because the way that he has put this together is through kind of first principles intellectual rigor. He says, here is the question we are investigating. He defines every word. What should we do? Is that the, is that the line? I, and then he goes word by, he, like he spends 10 minutes on what? It is a thing of beauty. I invite you to watch the video. How should we build a, a healthy, religiously diverse democracy? Let me define the terms. Democracy is not just a place where people vote for their representatives. Democracy is a society where people get to make personal convictions public. I'll say that again. Democracy is a form of society in which people get to make personal convictions public. You can stand out on that corner and you can hand out flyers advocating for a pro-choice view. You can shout about it at the top of your lungs. You can seek to raise money for pro-choice causes. You can look to elect pro-choice candidates. You can do all of that within some limits on that corner. And somebody can stand on the corner opposite from you, and they can hand out leaflets and raise money and start a nonprofit and seek to elect candidates for the exact opposite cause. And you can say, this view comes from my deepest religious, spiritual, and identity commitments. The person in the other corner can say the exact same thing. A democracy is a place where people get to make personal convictions public. Diversity is not just the differences you like. I want to say that again, right? I am at a number of schools these days in which people from a variety of races, genders, sexualities, and religions are in a in a room together, they talk about how diverse they are, and if you name the top 10 issues in American life, they all agree on their ideology on them. I just don't think that's a diverse room. Diversity is not just the differences you like. Diversity is being able to deal with people who have very different ideas of how a society should run, of who should be elected to office, of what various, how various laws should look. It's the ability to engage those differences. Religion, for Paul Tillich, is about ultimate concerns. So, Michael Walzer, in his great book, What It Means to Be an American, famously said that for centuries, political philosophers, literally from the time of the Greeks, believed that if you wanted diversity in a society, it had to be under a dictatorship. Because think about this. How would any society allow another group's views on ultimate concerns reign over them? How would you ever allow people who believe something very different, not just cosmically, but the ability to put that into law and policy and practice. How would you ever allow that group to be elected? It has to be under a dictatorship. If you want a democracy, Walzer says, this is his reading of political philosophy, it has to be homogenous. One people makes one state. What is one people? Same race, same ethnicity, same religion. Of those, religion was the most important, most people thought. Think about how I define religiously diverse democracy. The differences 
you don't like on matters of ultimate concern that can be made public amongst other difference, amongst a whole set of conflicting views. That's a recipe for civil war. Walzer ends that section and begins the next one with this line, until the United States of America. It's interesting, right? For all of the sins and mistakes of the founders, and they are legion, and they should be talked about, and we should not forget them, and some we should not forgive. For all of those, about religious diversity, mostly right. When George Washington got a letter from a man named Moses Sessius, leader of the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, 1790, 91. Moses Sessions says, you know, what's gonna to happen to my people in this new nation? Right, now that we have ratified the Constitution, now that the 13 colonies are all riding under one banner, what's gonna to happen to my people, we who have been hated and hounded and harassed so much, especially in Europe? And Washington writes back, my government will give to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance. Let the children of the stock of Abraham sit in safety under their own vine and fig. Let there be none to make them afraid. That's 1791. First iftar in the White House is not held by Barack Obama or George W. Bush or Bill Clinton. It's held by Thomas Jefferson. Ben Franklin makes a donation to the building funds of every religious sect, including a Jewish community, in Philadelphia. He says, the only thing I want, I want all of you to thrive. The only thing I ask is you celebrate July 4th together and commemorate my funeral collectively. <laughs> Not every one of your prayers to get me higher up there. Um, he builds a hall in Philadelphia, uses his own money. He says, the pulpit of this hall will be open to a preacher of any persuasion. If, says directly, if the, Mufti of Grand, of, 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 uh, if the Grand Mufti of Constantinople wants to send an imam preaching Islam, this pulpit is at his service. And actually, some of the earlier European settlers, they set the template for this, right? So John Winthrop lands in the Massachusetts Bay, what, 1630, 31, 10 miles from here, 15 miles from here, and he builds a theocracy an anti-Catholic theocracy, calls it a bulwark against the Antichrist. He is creating something that will be impervious to the designs of Jesuits. Just note this, right? America launches not just as a racist project, but as an anti-Catholic project. How many of you woke up this morning worried about anti-Catholicism? Serious. Is it not remarkable that over the past several hundred years, the United States has largely metabolized that? Because I had this little bit role in the Obama administration, I was on the South Lawn of the White House in October of 2015, when a black president introduced the first pope. I thought to myself, somebody wake Lyman Beecher up from the grave and say the nightmare came true. <laughs> okay? Roger Williams alights here in Boston Harbor a couple years after John Winthrop. And though he's just as deeply Puritan as Winthrop is, he decides he doesn't want a theocracy. And he leaves, gets banished for Rhode Island, learns the language of the local Native American populations, does a sympathetic study of their cosmology, writes somewhere, why can't we have the idea of Muslims, Jews, Quakers, Baptists as subjects. Doesn't all knowledge and experience show that they can be peaceful and loyal citizens, fair and just dealers? This is like 1640. This nation, at a mass level, is the first experiment in religiously diverse democracy. And you might say, Yes, but look at how we violated it along the way. And that is absolutely true. And what I find even more inspiring is how citizen movements 
helped realize those early ideals. So let me tell you about one of those movements. Did you know that when the pilgrims arrived on Plymouth Rock and they dusted off the stone, they saw the words Judeo-Christian nation etched in it? I'm just kidding. All you like, you know, like I did really well on my SATs, but that, I caught you out on that one, buddy. Think about this for a second. If that's not where the term comes from, if it wasn't written in the sky when John Winthrop arrived, if it wasn't given to Moses on Mount Sinai several thousand years ago, where does the word come from? I mean, you've heard it enough, right? The current occupant said not that long ago, uh, we're going to bring back Judeo-Christian values so that everybody can say Merry Christmas again. <laughs> I'll pause 10 seconds for you to make your own joke. <laughs> where does it come from? What's that? Very close. Very close. Uh, it emerges after one of the American versions of, let's call it American pogroms, in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan 20s, at a time when the Klan numbered three and a half, four million people. It's a lot of avowed white racists for a country that didn't, you know, was still growing in population. Uh, Anti-black, anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic. Uh, one of the great victories of the Klan in the 1920s was to light Al Smith's Democratic president, uh, presidential candidacy on fire. So Al Smith was the governor of New York. He was a Catholic, first Catholic to run on a major party ticket for president. And... Uh, the Klan and other anti-Catholic nativist forces said things like, Al Smith opened up the tunnel in New York, I think it was the Lincoln Tunnel, so that he could sneak the Pope in faster. He's going to send a one-word telegram to the Pope, unpack. Right? Al Smith is, is a facilitator of a papal takeover in the United States. They lit the candidacy on fire, and Al Smith loses. And a group of Americans watching this happen, having seen the madness of the Klan over the course of the 1920s decides to start an organization. They call it the NCCJ, National Conference, uh, back then National Conference for Christians and Jews, now the National Conference for Community and Justice. And they basically say, we can't be a country that excludes the contributions of Jews and Catholics. We have to be a nation that welcomes that. Right, that makes those people feel like they're part of the American family. And they run all kinds of civic projects all across the country. Tri-faith dialogues, and you know, they go to college campuses, and because it's the run-up to World War II, they're going to, uh, to military bases. They make 772 visits to military bases across the world. The message is the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. And they know that what they also have to do is kind of create a new American narrative. The Protestant narrative, whatever the founders' ideals might have been, whatever the beautiful language of the Flushing Remonstrance and the letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, the culture of the United States was still fiercely Protestant. Franklin Roosevelt, that great liberal lion, was once quoted as saying, this is a Protestant nation and the Jews and Catholics are here under sufferance. That's how fiercely Protestant much of the culture of this nation was. It's the NCCJ knew that they needed a different story. So what did they do? They invented a term, Judeo-Christian America. It's made up. It's a fiction. It was made up not 5,000 years ago, not 400 years ago, but barely 90 years ago. And it's not especially theologically accurate. You know, a lot of my Christian friends, Jesus is the son of the living God, Lord and Savior. For some folks, no one gets to the Father except through him. My Jewish friends, Jesus was a good rabbi. Maybe. Discuss. <laughs> right? Think about it. Judeo-Christian America, it's not, it's, not, it's not like theologically accurate. And it's not especially historically accurate. It's not like Jews fared really well in Christian societies for much of 
Western history. So what is it? It's a brilliant civic invention. It is the most American of things. When the current story runs its course, but you need to keep on going, what do you do? Write a next chapter. So what do you think I'm going to ask you now? In a nation in which Diana Eck says is the most, uh, has the city, Los Angeles, that's the most complex Buddhist city in the world? More Buddhist communities from more different parts of the world live in LA than in any other city in the world. The most complex Muslim country in the world, more Muslims from more different backgrounds are in this piece of sacred earth than any other patch of land around the world except for the Hajj. What comes after Judeo-Christian? I mean, it's done great work for 80 or 90 years. Right? I mean, you could be critical of it, but honestly, think, would you rather be a Jew in America in 1970 or in 1920? It helped move us a few inches forward. Right? Gary Snyder, the great Buddhist poet, says, all you can really hope for is to move the world a millionth of an inch. Judeo-Christian did its job. But what comes next? So you know what I love? This image of these people around this table thinking to themselves, you know, we're doing these great civic projects and we're going to military bases and we feel like, you know, we're on the right side of history, but I don't know, just, is there something bigger out there? And the guy who's leading it is this, you know, young guy, a guy named Everett Clinchy. And I think to myself, like, some group of, like, tough students, Northeastern students, Harvard students, some group, Y'all are like meeting right now, and you're thinking to yourself, like, what, what's next? Right? How do we make sure that we are realizing the opportunities of the greater Chicagoland food depositories, religious diversity, and not being afraid of the threats? Like, who's got that expertise? Who's building that knowledge base? Who's building that skill set? Right? Who's thinking about what to call the next chapter in America's mostly glorious history of religious diversity. And what I think is so inspiring is like other people have done that in the past and we have inherited it and now we do our part. So what's the name of it? What's the skills folks need? What's the knowledge that we require to build a healthy, religiously diverse democracy? What happens to St. Jude's Catholic School to those students, right? What does a religiously diverse civil society look like in the early 21st century? The single best part about working with really smart students on college campuses is I don't need the answer. I'm not smart enough to have the answer, right? All I got to do is plant the question with you all. This beautiful line at the end of Hamilton, I just took my kids to see it, you know. This beautiful line, right? America, you unfinished symphony, you sent for me. This is still a question that requires our best minds. The kind of minds that would in another area be put to nuclear physics. That's you all. This unfinished symphony is sent for you. Thank you. Ibu, thank you so much for such a thoughtful and timely lecture, Russell Lecture. And I know that there are probably many questions and thoughts on our minds. Ibu has uh, generously offered to give us five or ten minutes to engage with him. Uh, so we have some microphones uh, that we will bring around. But if anyone has questions uh, or comments, please, please stand up uh, or raise your hand and we'll come to you.
Hi, thank you for your beautiful lecture. Um, I was wondering your opinion on how do you engage in religious and like interfaith dialogue and work, um, especially with like like you said the differences that we don't like while retaining like the safety of people who are marginalized with marginalized identities. I'm um, like thinking specifically of queer and trans people. Um, whose identities might not always be respected in some religious communities, how do you um, kind of take the two and have, have both the, the dialogue and the work that you need while also making sure that people are safe and respected? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think when I do interfaith work, I just expect disagreement. I just, I just like, I'm in a smiley Muslim. I'm part of a small community of Shia Muslims that many Muslims don't regard as Muslims and that other people just have never heard of. Um, I just, I just don't expect, I don't, I just don't expect, I don't, I don't expect uh, the same respect from other people that I would expect of my friends. Interfaith work is not about my friends, right? Um, there are some places I wouldn't enter where, where I'm like, I'm, I'm not, you know, like I find this hateful. Um, but if I declare, if I find myself declaring 50% of the world or the nation hateful, then it's my problem. What I mean by that is like I've just, by my problem, what I mean is that I've just, you know, Jane Addams has a great line that if, if, you, if you limit your interactions, you have circumscribed your your range of life and your ethics, right? And so it just, it means I learn less and I convince fewer people. That doesn't mean I can't do it. Like I am not, I'm not standing up here and saying you have to do this. I'm saying uh, if you're going to do interfaith work, expect disagreement. Expect disagreement on matters of ultimate concern. Expect people to, uh, um, to believe that they have the banquet when it comes to cosmic matters. Uh, expect people to have uh, different views on things that, that you think are really important. And if you don't wanna do it, that's fine, right? It's totally fine. Um, I, the analogy I use is, you know, when the mountain climber approaches the mountain, she's not surprised. She came to climb the mountain. She's prepared, right? So I think if you're gonna do interfaith work, you, you have to prepare yourself for that. And I think that people have different zones of comfort. It's totally fine, right? Um, when, uh, when I heard that a, a, a group had said at uh, a particular small college I was going to that inviting me as the convocation speaker on campus was inviting somebody who sat at the right hand of the devil, um, and uh, this was said to me as a warning a month before I came. And then a week before I arrived, I got an invitation from that group to come speak to them. Of course I accepted the invitation. I mean, what, what are they gonna do to me? Be mad at me, right? Like I would much rather have that conversation. That's the decision that I made. I'm not saying everybody has to make that decision, but I, I am saying that for us to have a healthy, religiously diverse democracy, we need to have enough people who are willing to deal with the differences with which they are uncomfortable to, uh, to strengthen that civic fabric. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, um, for me, like a stark example. I do not, if I have a heart condition and I require a two-person heart surgery, I don't care if the heart surgeons voted for different people. They need to perform their heart surgery on me. Right? And I, that's kind of how I see a lot of civic life in America, that the only way you have a healthy religiously diverse democracy is if you can disagree on some fundamental things and work together on other fundamental things. Otherwise, I mean, do we, do we find ourselves in a situation where people are saying, I will not perform a heart surgery with you because your views make me feel disrespected? No, I am not saying that in a dismissive way. Right? I'm not saying feeling disrespected is, I'm not saying like get over it, snowflakes. I'm saying in order to have a diverse democracy, 
you have to be able to disagree on some fundamental things and work together on other fundamental things. Otherwise, it's not, a, it's not, otherwise it's not diversity. Hi there. I was so happy to hear you um, sort of mention Tillich and his concept of ultimate concern, but I, I was also thinking about how in his theology, doubt is such an integral part of arriving at your ultimate concern, so you have to sit with like moments of deep uncertainty and deep doubt, and I was wondering how you handle moments of deep uncertainty in your work, especially following tragedies like what happened in Christchurch recently or the Tree of Life massacre. Um, how do you deal with those moments of doubt? So the those, thank you for, for, for your question. Um, I, so those, uh, uh, maybe I'm getting, I'm not fully understanding the question, but th those moments make me weep, they don't make me doubt, right? Like those, those are, those are uh, uh, that's the act or the, the ultimate ugliness of the human condition. What happens in the aftermath is the ultimate beauty of the human condition. And I think to myself, I wanna be part of the spirit of, of the aftermath and part of the work that would, as much as possible, prevent such acts. So, so, so but did you mean doubt in a different kind of way? When these things happen, like, um, do you doubt the sort of, um, I guess the purpose of your work? Because, I don't know, sometimes when, I work as an interfaith engagement coordinator at a very small college, and when these things happen, I sort of feel like I'm, I'm like, you know, it's like drops in an ocean, and I wonder like what the impact of my work is on a larger scale. So I was thinking doubt in that sense, like yeah. when these tragedies happen. Uh, no, no, uh, um, I, you know, your, your job is to move the world a millionth of an inch. I think that Gary Snyder line is really profound. There are seven billion people on the planet, and some of them are crazy. Seriously, right? And, and there's way too, many, way too many small arms around and sometimes those things cross and sometimes uh, uh, really ugly ideologies uh, make crazy people crazier. And so I, I, I don't measure the success of, of our work against um, uh, preventing every single one of those things. I think we have time for maybe one more question. And then Ibu actually is gonna stay with us to um, hopefully sign some books. Actually, we have a number of his books here. Hi. Um, you make such a compelling case for the way in which religion um, is in the DNA of civic society in America. As certain segments of the American population turn away from religion, how will that impact civic society in the future? Yeah. That's a great, so, so um, I think that's a really huge question and I don't know, but that, that's, you know, I was having a conversation earlier with, uh, um, with some faculty here at Tufts University and part of what is in the mix is this idea of could Tufts be a place for an academically rigorous program of interfaith studies? and any academically rigorous program would have a set of research questions associated with it, and I think that that, that is an absolutely key research question, right? What, what happens to American civil society in a post-religious era? Let's just say, like, let's recognize that we are, we're in pro and we are in one of the five least religiously, uh, uh, least religious cities in the country. Right, so if you went to Oklahoma City, it's not the same. If you go to Dallas, it's not the same, right? When I get off the flight in, in, uh, in South Carolina, there's literally people at the airport who are saying, you know, my name is Amy Sue and I go to the Lutheran church, which one do you go to, right? And I, I love, like, that's, that's America. I love that. I, th I think that that's really important. And, and part of what I'm saying is, is just let's not, assume the rest of America rolls the way people with PhDs in Boston roll, right? This is still a nation with the soul of a church, as G.K. Chesterton said. But 
there's also no doubt that participation in religious communities is falling, and that's gonna have an impact on civil society, right? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, there, there are times when I'm with particularly politically engaged audiences, and there's a little bit of an eye roll that happens when I talk about the importance of civil society. Uh, and there's there's a sense of like this isn't political enough like the you know the real action is like political stuff right um, no I'm being descriptive here I'm not at all being dismissive so like I don't you know I, I, I think that I think that American civil society is like one of the one of the great geniuses of human civilization right uh, a third of AA groups meet in churches. So tell me what happens when churches close in the next, th where are they gonna go, right? I mean, do we not want places where Trump voters and Hillary voters and Bernie bros and uh, AOC supporters are like opening up by saying, hi, my name is Donald and I'm an alcoholic and like helping each other? Like I, and for me, that's the genius of American civilization is we have, lots of spaces that bring people who disagree on fundamental things together to do positive things together. So, like, I can't stand the current occupant. Let me be clear, right? And when my wife tells me that the guy who runs the travel basketball league that my kids play in, they got her athleticism, not mine, uh, was retweeting Trump quotes, I'm like, I can't, and then I stopped and I thought to myself, do I really want a nation where people from the same political party won't play basketball in leagues with people from the other political party? I actually really don't want that nation, right? And that's American civic life. And a huge part of it is generated by religious communities. I wanna make one more comment on this, just to kind of highlight just how how remarkable this is. So in the, the, a famous early document from Harvard, uh, like 16, 1640s, 1650s, uh, uh, lots of you will have heard this quoted. They said, uh, now that we have come to this new land, uh, they didn't mention the part about the murdering of the American Indians, but now that we have come to this land um, and we've set up a civil government and we have set up in early, the early signs of our economy, and we have set up our churches, we are building a university because we do not want to leave an Ill illiterate ministry to our churches when our current ministers should lie in the dust. Why was Harvard built? Harvard was built to educate future ministers for Puritan churches. Harvard was built as an institution of a particular religious community principally for the continuity of that community. What is Harvard now? It is a public good. What is Tufts now? It is a public good. What do I mean by that? I mean that it is stunning that we have a civil society of institutions built by religious communities, first and foremost, for service and continuity of their community that now serve as public goods. Right? That's, that, is, that doesn't happen everywhere. There was a recent New York Times article about the city of Moster in Bosnia and Herzegovina and opens with, if you're a Catholic and there's a fire in your house, the Catholic fire department will come make the call, but not the Muslim fire department. And if you're a Muslim, and you like to dance, you will go to the Muslim nightclub, but not the Catholic one. And if you're a Catholic and you go to school, you go to school from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. when Catholics go to school. And if you're Muslim and you go to school, you go from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. when Muslims go to school. In other words, they have a civil society that is also built by religious communities, and it is entirely balkanized. Right? So I think our diverse civil society is a little bit like William Carlos Williams' Red Wheelbarrow. Remember that poem from high school, right? This so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow 
glistening with rain beside the white chickens. That, you know, you don't think about how important it is until you realize what the alternative are, alternatives are. And, and like you, I am concerned both with the erosion of participation in religious communities and the hyperpolarization, tribalism and partisanship that we are in danger of that red wheelbarrow rotting and us not, us not knowing it. Thank you. <laughs>